When Ryan's when it's time to begin It's on the review but round with John Pollock And waiting the A-team That makes sense of these things we see in the ring Every week on TV It's review a round for Monday night Download a Tuesday morning from the Fight Network site It's review a round for Monday night On USA Now on the John and Way Take the mic How are you, Way? Happy Thanksgiving Thanks, man. Happy Thanksgiving Happy Columbus Day to our friends in America and uh, whatever other uh, thing you might be, happy Monday to any, everybody else. Lots to come, so let us get into Raw now, uh, which was taking place on Monday night from Indianapolis, Indiana, at the Banker's Life Fieldhouse, which was significant because it is in this building that The Shield debuted at the Survivor Series in 2012 and the same building where they did the breakup in 2014. Did they mention that? I think it was it was mentioned briefly by I think Michael Cole mentioned it at one point during the show. No, I must have missed it. I skipped I skip a lot of the entrances, so I, I miss some of that stuff sometimes. Yeah, you you probably read it in my news update today. That's probably where you. It's well, I know you said it last week actually. Oh, did I? Yeah. I don't. I can't remember. Miz TV kicks off the show, and it is part two of the Mizzies, the Camp Miz Award Show of the season. And it is The Miz and Curtis Axel inside the ring. And conspicuous by his absence is Bo Dallas. Yeah. Bo was nowhere to be found. And they just briefly said that they are thinking of him and to get well soon. So, I mean, on the one hand, you could say that they were just selling the attack from last week. But that makes no sense with Axel there. Yeah, other than maybe the fact that they, they maybe they wanted to do the kind of... um three on three initially with the Miz outside the ring, you know, that spot that came at the end here. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if there was uh, anything more to it. Yeah. It yeah. was just very strange because if you had Curtis Axel there, I'm sure ideally they would have wanted Dallas there as well. So I don't know if he's hurt. I don't know if there was some issue, but maybe he's just celebrating Columbus day. Um, maybe. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. What I like was that, uh, they've started to incorporate, um, on the Titan Tron, an applause uh, sign. Uh, anytime, I guess, The Miz wants the audience to applaud. And I think it's a really clever way to elicit boos. But um, this week, at least, people were actually actually following along and applauding. Yeah. Like he, sheep. He was. He handed out the first Mizzy to Curtis Axel for perseverance. And this is where Axel dedicated the award to Bo. And they tell him that they're thinking of him. The next one is a tie and goes to Seamus and Cesaro for Best Supporting Actor from last week's angle. They come out. They call it an honor. They thank Roman Reigns as he lay in the ring last week. And, and Seamus yells, Yo, Roman, we did it, to give us our Rocky reference of the week. Then Cesaro went to speak, and I guess he's learning his promo styles from Shinsuke Nakamura because he spoke with his mouth guard in. Now, he might be given a pass because he may have to keep something in his mouth while it's recovering from that surgery. So maybe it's not a uh, mouth guard that he can just remove so easily. Oh, I'm positive it's for that. But even if he didn't need it, I think it's a great way to remind people that this man suffered this injury. I think it's worth essentially selling it for a bit, right? I also like the fact that he got more words that he had to say here than most weeks when he could speak normally. Mm -hmm. They gave him more dialogue here. And for the most part, you could understand what he was saying. The mouth guard, I mean, should really be, it could be his thing. Just kind of like it was at one time for uh, uh, other wrestlers. Who am I thinking of? Like Kurt Angle? Who, yeah. else, who, else, who else did the mouth guard thing? Um... I mean, Kurt Angle and Nakamura are the ones that uh, immediately come to mind for me. But plenty, Kyle O'Reilly. Um, yeah. There's a lot that use mouth guards. Um, yeah. But not so many that cut promos with them in. I mean, that's the first thing Joe Rogan tells you is get your mouth guard out. i got to speak to you. Mm -hmm. The Miz said that the Shield was great in their time, but they don't want any of this. They put an end to Roman Reigns, something that Lesnar, Undertaker, and Cena could not do. And Miz delivers the final Mizzy to himself, who he calls the real big dog, and dedicates this award to his unborn child and for other children that need a role model. So Roman Reigns comes out and tells them to clear out of his ring. Miz says, you're going to do nothing because it's four on one. And the crowd is chanting for the shield. Miz says the rumors of a shield reunion are just like Reigns, 
a lot of hype. Rain says, who said anything about rumors? As Dean Ambrose walked out to join him and then was joined by Seth Rollins. And all three stood on the ramp. The crowd was really into this. Miz was fantastic here as his face changed from confidence and cockiness to genuine fear of what he has what he has caused here by these three getting together. He did the big gulp like Vince McMahon. The shield come down, they surround the ring, they took a long time to just milk this and the crowd reacting. And then they started fighting. There were Superman punches to Cesaro and Sheamus. The Kings landing to Sheamus. They cleared the ring. Miz had escaped and he's just standing on the floor. They force him inside, hit him with the dirty deeds. Place is going crazy. And then they hit the triple power bomb to the Miz and then just for way. All three men fisted for the first time in three and a half years. That's the best. When you don't fist for a while and get that first fist in, it's, it's the best. Like riding a bike for these three. Mm-hmm. I thought it was really well done. Uh, I thought the whole segment was well done from the framework of having the Mizzy Awards to essentially to essentially let all these guys cut their promos. I thought even Cesaro and Sheamus had a good showing. But the Miz especially, I thought, very impassioned. I think he's a great leader for the group. Um, and, uh, initially I almost felt like Miz should have really escaped the segment unscathed, especially because you had, you know, uh, three other people who, who, uh, paired off with the, with the shield. I thought Miz could have escaped the power bomb and you could have saved that spot either for next week or, at, or actually at the, uh, at the show. But I think, um, seeing the rest of the show, we know that perhaps the intent here was to show that the shield greatly outpower the Miz and the bar by themselves and that the heels need some somebody else in order to match up with them. Yeah, I think that was the whole idea here was that you were going to be introducing the the fourth member of the team because I thought the same thing as you. It was like they they went all out for the Shield reunion and just made them look like world beaters here that you almost left the heels with nothing. Um but that would change throughout the show. So, very strong. What did you think about starting off the show with what was easily the the biggest card you had to play on Monday night with the reunion. Uh, what did they have at ten o'clock? At ten o'clock, they had uh, that was uh, that was oh, the introduction God. of we'll we'll get to that the uh, Jesus the forgotten sister. Um, well, I mean, the alternative would have been starting off with Bray Wyatt and Finn Balor, so I think this was probably your best choice. And, I mean, you did have the shield worked in throughout the show. It was not, this is not like something you could have built to near the end because you had a lot more on top of this that you were going to build from. Correct, correct. And I think like everybody predicted, uh, once you throw in the the shield association with Roman Reigns, he's loved again. You know, this was the most over Roman has been as a babyface in a very long time. And uh, Roman by himself, not that attractive, but you put put the, uh, the other two next to him and... They're all well liked. Yeah, and as I said Sunday night, this is something they can they can ride out for the rest of the year is the Shield doing matches together on mm-hmm. the pay per views through the end of the year. And I think that I don't think you should do another breakup with the Shield in the next six to twelve months. I think that you should have this association with Roman because it's something that I think it, it enhances him to have his allies. I agree. I mean, the uh, they 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 the shield themselves, and I think everybody watching complained that they were broken up too soon while they were in the midst of uh, uh, their babyface run, and they never really did have that babyface run. So hopefully, in the next several months, they can get that time to really, you know, now that they're bigger stars than before, uh, get that good babyface run on top. And I don't. I would hope that a breakup would be would feel organic and not just. Uh, you know, kind of forced and, and and have it be done for the sake of it. They aired a SmackDown commercial for Tuesday night, and it will feature why Sami Zayn did what he did to Shane McMahon. And we're going to get Baron Corbin versus AJ Styles for the United States title in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Jason Jordan versus Carl Anderson. The crowd was chanting too sweet. Anderson was in control, going after the left arm of Jordan. Cole calls out, how Booker is flip-flopping on his opinion. And Booker just blows off Cole and Graves, saying, you've never been inside the ring. And Michael Cole corrects him, saying, uh, Corey has. And I've had quite a few matches myself. And Booker just, <laughs> like, rolled his eyes. 
Jordan they were, made it. They were, they were really going after him. And they I mean, went, like, Booker was ready to just blow a gasket at points during this show, I felt. Yeah, I mean, um, I've kind of just um, begun to just tune him out. So I can't really, I don't know if it's really justified them going after him like that. But um, I can't say it helps the overall product at all, you know, whenever they... They just spend time, you know, analyzing what Booker says, and then Booker has to feel the need to defend himself, and it's just, they all look stupid, I feel. Well, it's it's a deeper issue that I I feel as, I read so much stuff about Lance Russell over the past week, is just like, and it's laughable that you would even compare Michael Cole to Lance Russell, but I think that's that's part and parcel, I think, an issue they have, that here's a guy that he just, He'll push Booker's buttons. And at the end of the day, Michael Cole is just an easily dislikable individual. And he's your voice. He's your voice on your flagship show. And I think there's something to that of not having that that announcer that can really get across, have any credibility, and especially when it comes to getting baby faces over, which we've outlined has been a massive issue for this company. Yeah, Um I mean, and the question is whether or not it's Michael Cole or if it's the people talking to Michael Cole on the headsets. That well, are it's, responsible. it's the entire right. presentation. Michael Cole is right. the the character. Yeah, he's yeah. the spokesperson. Anyway, uh, Jordan makes his comeback, spear in the corner. Then Anderson thumbs him in the eye, uh, and Jordan knocks Gallows off the apron after recovering. Anderson misses him with a splash in the corner. Jor- Jordan hoists him up into the reverse neckbreaker slam and pins Carl Anderson. And Jordan is just kind of spinning his wheels. No, uh, nothing with Matt Hardy this week. It's just kind of he's in his own world and feuding with Anderson and Gallows. So maybe that's going to be thrown onto TLC as Matt Hardy and Jordan against Anderson and Gallows. That could be a kickoff match. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Maybe maybe their choice is to keep him kind of in the background for now as he kind of finds his voice. I don't know. I think he actually looks great in ring. I think he's got an in-ring style that's quite entertaining to watch. Um, it's, you know, I'm just waiting for his character to catch up because he continues to be uh, awfully vanilla. And, you know, again, with the whole um, uh, uh, son thing, just feels very di- disingenuous. Miz is in the trainer's room from the attack, and Axel is helping him. Kurt walks in and stumbles around trying to say, be careful for what you wish for, and makes a TLC match for TLC with the six-man main event, and Miz is pissed that Angle is rewarding the Shield with this match at the pay-per-view. So that was the first iteration of the main event. Do we have any other uh, stipulations that ask for any of the other matches? No. No, all we have is a TLC match, and the rest yeah. are all regular matches so far. Yeah, which I, I, I prefer if they're going to keep that. I mean, I don't like stipulations happening for the sake of stipulations, and a pay-per-view with more than one stipulation just kind of seems to water everything down. So I, I suppose they might be treating this one like you know Hell in a Cell, like Money in the Bank, where the, the, the namesake match is really just for the main programs. The only hot program is this TLC match. Every other program doesn't, like, there's no feud that, I mean, you can add a stipulation to it, but to me it would just be exactly what you're saying, throwing it for the sake of throwing a, like, why, Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt having a chairs match. I mean, it just it makes no oh, sense. Man. Let's I'm sad, a, I'm, a sad we're not, chair. I'm sad we're not getting a stairs match this year. Oh, it's unfortunate. Well, we, maybe we will. Maybe. Um, Elias is in the ring. He a says, rocking chair match? A oh, rocking that'd chair. Be, that'd be great. Elias says that Indianapolis is like driving the tightest worldwide car in the Indy 500, where you're going around in circles and no one cares. And he goes to play a song, but is interrupted by Titus coming out with a banjo. And he asks who wants to walk with Titus worldwide, and he proceeds to perform a horrendous song as he introduced Apollo Crews, and this audience just... They were too polite to boo, but this was pretty dreadful. It made me want to hate um, Titus more. Like, it made me want to cheer for Elias, because Titus' song was so bad. It's like, Titus... I feel like every now and then they give him these opportunities to really have a segment that... I mean, if he came out here and had something really clever and great, it would have gotten over. 
But anytime Titus is put in these roles, I mean, he's just terrible at them. I know, I know, he was probably meant to be terrible, but like, even remember if you're when meant he was be... Thaddeus Bullard that one week, his his no. alter ego. Ugh, he, oh, he anyway. Yeah, like I know he was meant to be uh, bad, but like I think even when you're trying to be bad, you needed to do something entertaining uh, in order to win the crowd over. I think he, to me, he just turned the crowd. Why would you? Why would me. you want him to go out there and bomb? Like, why would you want the baby face to come he, out and yeah, be? No terrible the idea is that he's mocking elias um but at least elias is talented i mean okay talented i say that word loosely but at least he could play the instrument and at least he put some effort into his rhymes I, titus titus just just came out and just didn't really put that much effort into it i felt the match began during the break elias Walked the top rope and came down on the arm of Apollo. Apollo. He did it. the he did the old school. He did so the he, old school, which they called the walking with Elias. Is that what that is? Is that so? So it's not obvious. <laughs> so we're not going to lead to. Uh, we're not building to an Elias Undertaker match or anything like that. They're going to do a tightrope contest. Wow, Undertaker and Elias. Sure. Okay. The uh, the Undertaker will come out of retirement. To yeah. do that, a tightrope walking match. With his knees. Could you imagine wow. him scaling that top rope? Sure. What a finish this was. Apollo was swarming him with strikes in the ropes, and Elias just grabbed him and threw him into the rope, and he bounced off into the drift away and was pinned like a fool. <laughs> this, this was this was so weak. A, essentially, a rope break was used as the distraction finish. To lead to uh, that, the that heel was, winning here. That was the big heat for the heel to get his victory. <laughs> Booker says Apollo needs expert tutelage, and Titus isn't it. So, I, I'll, like I said, I'll I'll be I'll be very really happy just to see Elias come out, do his song, and then leave because the the match is usually the the come down, um, and it's this this feud. I feel like last week maybe or the week prior they, it had some good moments, but. Um, I don't know. I think I think the Titus trend of like having pretty lackluster segments on on TV for the past year now uh, is continuing. I was just amazed at this this throwaway match of how Apollo Cruz was clearly the babyface and Elias was clearly the heel, and yet you could not have you could not have booked a babyface to look more like an idiot than Apollo Cruz did from start to finish here punctuated by Booker's assessment at the end of how Titus is a total moron that's guiding this guy into oblivion. Anyway, Mm -hmm. not a match that needs any more analysis. Yeah. Enzo came out to start the second hour, and he wants to talk about Sexy Kurt, who he then clarifies is the general manager. He refers to himself as Sugar Ray Amore, and explains how no one in the loserweight division was supposed to be able to touch him, and then Kalisto came and assaulted him and has been put into a title match at TLC. He called Kalisto a Tostito, so he should have dipped, and he wants to speak with Angle. So Angle comes out, and Enzo questions why he thanks the crowd when they just chant, you suck. Pulls out a crumpled piece of paper, which is the no-contact contract, and Angle brings up the fine print that it only applied to cruiserweight signed before the clause was signed and that Kalisto was signed after the contract was signed. So Enzo established that this is Kurt Angle's cruiserweight division. So we now know who the mastermind is behind the cruiserweight division. It's Kurt Angle and Enzo is his champion. So Angle says he wants to make him happy. So forget about the title match at TLC. Instead, the title match is tonight. And Enzo only agrees to the title match if it's the main event. So Angle agrees. He then walks up the ramp and tells Enzo if he tries to get counted out or disqualified, it won't work because the no contact clause is on hold tonight, which is not how contracts work. And it will be a lumberjack match tonight. Mm -hmm. What a a lazy way to get to a match was you, you establish this entire scenario for your division. But then you come up with an idea where you basically have to render your own two-week-old stipulation meaningless for tonight's match. 
t- I mean, they really kind of screwed themselves with with the stipulation. It's kind of tough to keep up, don't you think? They just don't think long term, and by oh. long term, I mean fourteen days. That maybe just to have a creative way out of this, like you've created this scenario, mm-hmm. and well, we'll talk about more about this later because this was quite the conclusion to Raw. But that was the main event set up for the. Uh, for the Cruiserweight title later tonight. Enzo so the, and Kalisto. Mm-hmm. So a third week in a row now, we're getting a Cruiserweight segment to end the show. So it seems to be something that they're sticking with. Not only that, they announced, they made an effort here to announce that Enzo Amore will, will be in the main event on the show tonight. The unofficial main event, but the technical main event. So, um, yeah, what do you think that's, that says? You know, the fact that they they're, they seem to be enjoying this format. Uh, I think it's the format they're happy with. I mean, I don't know what it really means that the Cruiserweights have inherited this spot where it is the guaranteed lowest viewed hour of the three, and they occupy the slot. So mm, right. I don't know if it's necessarily going to keep anybody. I think the the trend is going to continue to be the same as it's been the last two weeks, where it's still people tuning out, and I mean, they're at least building to a title match for the main event slot, but I don't look at this as some big endorsement or them having faith in the cruiserweights. I think it's just the slot they're putting them in. I think what it means is that like the days of having a, a show that builds to the last segment is over. Uh, yeah, it might be over. I mean, we're kind of building towards the 10 o'clock hour now and uh, 10 to 11 is really going to continue to be this throwaway hour that are, they're expecting people to not watch. Yeah, that's what it feels like. I mean, even now the overrun is getting shorter. There he went, I think it was five or six minutes they went past the hour, um, mm. which isn't a giant much, uh, amount that they've decreased it, but they are they are ending the show earlier now than they had been. Then we have Braun Strowman versus Matt Hardy. And Hardy is throwing strikes, just gets tossed by Braun. Braun blocked a side effect and tossed Matt, sent him to the floor, went through a commercial. Matt fights back, hit a tornado DDT, taking Braun off his feet, then hit a twist of fate, and Braun kicked out at one. He goes for another, Braun blocks, choke slams Matt twice, and then the power slam to pin Matt. Then he lifted Matt on his shoulders and was just going to take him away up the ramp. And the shield comes out, and these guys were busy over the past hour because they have new merchandise. Yeah. I Matching mean, Shield t-shirts. Maybe they have a press right there. Maybe one of those iron-on things. Maybe it was uh, Pro Wrestling Tees was there on site for them. Hmm. Braun lifts Matt. Uh, sorry, he puts down Matt. And then he charges at Reigns, driving him into the into the screen. All three go after Braun. Reigns spears him on top of the stage. And they're beating him down three on one. And... The crowd, even with the numbers advantage, the crowd still loved this. They cleared the announcer's desk and then triple powerbombed Strowman through the table, and then he rolled off the stage to the floor. So Braun was dead at the end of this segment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, and it would play, uh, it would le- I, I, and again, I think it, it was to show, meant to show maybe how powerful the shield is. Uh, that even somebody like a Braun Strowman can't t- stand up to him. And so um, for at least a brief moment in the WWE universe, the, the Shield are the most powerful entity that exists. The Shield are walking backstage and Charlie catches up to them. Seth refers to her as Charles. And they're going to destroy everyone in their path, even if it's four, five, or six guys at a time. And they will take on the whole world if they have to. And it ends with Roman saying, we are the three workhorses that run this business now. The, yeah. wor- the workhorses. Yeah, sure. Mickey James is out. She says that she didn't think people in the back got her since she returned. Doesn't know if it's her southern accent, country music, maybe it's her age. And she blames Alexa Bliss for thinking this way. Bliss has taken cheap shots at her behind her back and tells Alexa to jump out of her booster seat and put on her big girl pants because she is all woman. Alexa cannot say the same. And Mickey has more energy than Alexa has hair extensions and pink hair dye and says age ain't nothing but a number. And the only number I care about is seven for the number of title reigns I'm going for. So Alexa comes out 
and she has put together the Mickey James Career Retrospective to show all the young fans who Mickey James is. So we got this video entitled Superstars of Yesteryear, which was done in black and white with the old film style with the old timey voiceover. They put a lot of work into this way. I thought this was really good. Yeah, I thought it was amusing. It ended with the identification of the not yet late and not yet great Mickey James. And Bliss is laughing hysterically and asks if it's past grandma's bedtime and tells Mickey to go rest before their match. She's going to finish the film with the TLC match and will send it send the link to her or send it on a VHS copy. So Mickey makes her come back calling her Biscuit Butt, which the crowd began to chant. Alexa says they can do this right now. And she walks to the ring, but then holds up, saying that move is as old as you. But then Mickey goes, grabs her, pulls her into the ring, and Alexa escapes. And the crowd continued chanting at Alexa. So uh, they were given quite a lot of time here as uh, for this program and mm-hmm. a talking segment for the women. I thought Mickey was scripted pretty strongly here. And I think it's especially important for her to be scripted strongly in a storyline like this. Because Alexa has the easy ammunition here with the age thing. And Mickey, as the baby face, has to really overcome it with wit. And I think her words tonight, flipping it, basically calling Alexa a child, Mickey being proud that she's a full-grown woman, I thought was a strong comeback for all the taunting she's received. And, you know, it's it, it it's up to her and up to her, her promos and her verbiage uh, to, to really get the fans on her side uh, because – if her words aren't strong, this this could really damage her character. But if she's portrayed as somebody who can come up on top and uh, you know essentially step up to the bully, uh, she I think you know can benefit from it. Like I think she did this week. Then we have the latest Oscar feature, and we cut to Kurt Angle, who is in his office with Bailey and Sasha Banks. Bailey wants to be Oscar's opponent and welcome her with a hug. And a belly to belly. Sasha mm. says she wants to face Asuka. Then Alicia Fox wa- uh, comes in and does her crybaby routine and says, I've never even gotten a t-shirt in my 10 years here. Which uh, was she, act- she's, she said she had one, right? Did she? I don't think she ha- she's gotten one. That oh, was, okay. This was based off this interview she just did with Lillian Garcia where she actually mm-hmm. brought this up about how she's never... Received any merchandise. Oh, okay. So then Dana Brooke walked in and says she feels sometimes like she doesn't even exist. And then Emma comes in. She wants to face Asuka. Alicia brought up the fact that Emma walked out on her last week, which not a person remembered. And Angle says we settled things in the ring and made a five-way for tonight. A fatal five-way. The rules would be a mystery. And the winner would face Asuka at TLC. What a segment to really make you excited for Asuka's first opponent at TLC. This was dreadfully painful for me. Yeah. Um, Everyone. I mean, Bailey is such a dork now. Like, yeah. Jay have just... Like, she is just such a loser on this show. I I mean, outside of... Um, uh. I, I I can't I can't say like the, any of the five women here have really received uh, you know great storylines uh, in their time, uh, even including Sasha uh, on Raw. You know I I think I I mean I I almost feel like it's just you're dealing with five jobbers here, and you know Sasha and and uh, Bailey uh, being bundled in with uh, Alicia, Dana, and Emma just kind of maybe lowers their stock too. And you just compare kind of like these characters and and, and here to like the SmackDown women's roster. And I feel like the SmackDown's women's roster just has so much more color, so much more identity attached to all the characters Uh, here. They just, none of them feel like real compelling characters or contenders even. It's, it's really depressing in particular Bailey, but you're starting to see it with Sasha too, of just the level that, they have fallen to and i mean two years ago if you were to say the two can't miss baby faces on the nxt roster 
you would probably look at Bailey and Sami Zayn, and you just look at where they got with Sami Zayn as a babyface, and where ultimately Bailey is going as a babyface, that they're probably going to do the same thing and turn her at some point. And it's just amazing to me of where where this character has gone. And and Sasha doesn't feel like she's far behind either. So so what is this? Mm, what confidence does this give you about uh, how Asuka will be treated on Raw? Well, I, I don't look at them as the exact same. I think they have a massive issue with handling baby faces. And Asuka coming in is not your... I have more faith in them with Asuka than I do Bailey or did with Bailey. But that said, I'm not uh, I'm not expecting Asuka to be able to replicate what they had in NXT with her, where they could they could easily have kept her there and headline takeovers with Asuka. Um, this is the division she's going to be in, and in six months she's going to be doing these segments with Alicia Fox. And I think it's yeah. just, it's it's a problem with just these the, like this whole setup of how they set up these matches of these segments they do that just make these. Just these inconsequential characters. Yeah, I just, um, you just put an image in my head of like, imagine if like, okay, Sasha's there talking to, to Angle, Bailey's there, Alicia Fox comes in, Dana, and then Asuka comes in, uh, all bickering, uh, uh, asking for a title shot. That'd be really sad when that happens. You're going to have, like, Booker T yelling out Asuka's name. Like, Asuka. It's probably going to be her big uh, comeback spot in her match for Booker to yell. Who knows? Who knows where they go? I can't say I'm very optimistic about it. Uh, Cedric Alexander and Mustafa Ali versus Brian Kendrick and Jack Gallagher, who, since he's a heel now, he's given up on wrestling boots, so he works in dress shoes. Mm, that's well, gotta suck he's a badass now he doesn't care about um grip <laughs> or ankle support yeah the crowd was very subdued here they got the heat on cedric for a while gallagher choked him behind the referee's back ali got tagged in hit his rolling neck breaker to kendrick then kendrick and ali totally messed up this takedown that Corey graves was kind and called it unique and then they went right to the sliced bread for the finish and kendrick pinned ali they just seem to be um, had their timing off for the finish. It feels like it's been a while since we've had a cruiserweight segment on Raw not involving Enzo. So um, I think I, I, this match kind of just reminded me of where cru- cruiserweight matches on Raw used to feel like and how they still feel like because they built up to this hot tag to Mustafa Ali that was just ice cold frozen. And a hot tag that received no reaction. is It's like watching a comedian bomb on stage, you know. You would do all that work to to build up to a punchline, and then you just get no reaction. And you know, uh, it's just yeah, these are just kind of time filler matches. Well, this is the other side of the equation when you have a segment like last week where Enzo shines, but it's these guys who just look around like idiots. Cedric, the the non entertainer who has no charisma, as we have been instructed. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. that's what these cruiserweights feel like. They feel like they're it's Enzo's punchlines having a match together. Mm. they recap the shields attack from earlier and then Kurt Angle's on the phone Miz walks in he doesn't want the match called off as long as the shield stands by their word because earlier tonight Dean said they could take on four, five, or six guys so Miz wants a fourth partner and Kurt Angle reluctantly reluctantly agrees so his partner kicks open the door and it is Braun Strowman who will join the Miz, Cesaro, and Sheamus and it is now a four on three TLC match and answers the question of how Braun would be figured into TLC. Yeah. I love the idea of him just like walking around breaking through doors instead <laughs> of opening them. He do- he doesn't do knocking. Yeah. Do you do you think it makes the match more attractive? Uh I th- I think it helps it. I, I think having Braun in there. I think it was already going to be a pretty strong match and now you have you have Braun and weapons. So I mean yeah. I think that's a usually a pretty good mix. And, yeah, it should be quite a spectacle, but, man, it feels like a one-match show uh, at TLC. Sure. I, I I guess for main events, like for non-TV matches, I, I just, I've never loved handicap stipulations. It just you know, creates sort of a, a weird imbalance that 
doesn't seem to really solve any issues in their storylines. Um, but I mean, they, they portrayed the shield as this, such a powerful entity that, uh, there's no way Miz, even with Cesaro and Sheamus, which is an improvement from, you know, uh, Axel and, 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 uh, uh, Dallas, uh, even, I guess that tandem couldn't match up in, in the fans' minds. Um, but seeing the heels here being a four man team, do you think that they will probably win the match? Uh, I feel if you want to get some momentum, because like, uh, if they lose, man, how much does that 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 hurts all those guys? That hurts Strowman to lose in a four man team. Yeah, I think the match is going to be really great. That I, I think the audience should really be into it. That I, I still feel the Shield is winning the match. Um, but you also want to keep this stuff going. Like I don't know what the plan is for the Survivor Series with, but you would figure the Shield are going to be together in some form uh, for for that show, and you want to have some opponents ready. Mm. So, mm. Um, I mean, there's ways to do it where it's you know it's Sheamus that takes the fall, and you can still keep other aspects of it going, like Miz escapes or different ways you can do it. But I mean, it should be a pretty terrific match. That I, I think that it should be one of those matches where everyone comes out of it. I, I don't think anyone is, will be too hurt by whichever team goes over or not, but I, I just think they're going to, the first match back, they're going to have the shield win. What, what's going to be uh, hung on top of the ring? Um, it's probably just going to be, all the weapons are going to be involved and, Oh, so and, they're not, and, it's not and a ladder match. Fall. Oh, so it's not a ladder match. Yeah, I mean, some TLC matches they've just done, yeah, where it just ends with mm. with the fall. They won't have anything hung up. Maybe a Mizzy. Oh, okay. They could, sure. They could hang maybe, maybe one of those shirts, the new shirts. All possibilities, yeah. Maybe an actual shield. A shield? Or yeah. the, the door that Braun kicked off? Hmm. Kicked through? Finn Balor came out. Are you ready? Yeah. The crowd was chanting too sweet. And he said, last week, Bray introduced the world to Sister Abigail, and he is speechless. He says, Bray is like a poison and a virus that keeps mutating with more lives and mind games. He's desperate for attention and instilling fear. He's not afraid of Bray, and neither is the demon. If that was Sister Abigail, bring her on. Bring on the whole family. And then we see the rocking chair on the screen and Bray walks into the shot, sits down and says Finn will be afraid of her. She was young and beautiful. They turned her into a monster and he was there when she took her final breath. She chose me. The season of the witch is upon you, which is either a veiled threat or a reference to the worst Halloween movie. And then says she's here. And Bray transforms into Sister Abigail with this, like, I don't know, what would you say, like this, uh... Like a, like a veil, like some type of, um, like net? Yeah, this wearing. like, this like net bag over top of him. Yeah, like a, like basically like a, like silk stocking. They didn't uh, break the, they head. did not, uh, break the wardrobe budget for this transformation. But they did involve a voice box to alter Bray's voice to now speak as Sister Abigail. Well, I, I mean, they just pitch shifted his voice like two or three octaves. But are like we? You, but are we to believe that he? Yeah. Like, yeah, he, like he, if he, this is real way, what what should I be? Uh, what should I be thinking here? How uh, is, you, hey, you remember? Uh, the zone, uh, snit. Okay, that's what Bray Wyatt sounds like as Sister Abigail. Oh my God, snit. Well, uh, I was thinking of another four-letter word that started with an S and ended with a T for this segment. Um, he is teaching Bray. She is teaching Bray that the world is an evil place. Darkness is so much brighter than light. And will uh, and would always be by his side. The, these are the notes you take where you are questioning your career path. She was burned to a crisp, but she has risen. My sweet, innocent Bray. She knows all about demons 
and can turn a demon into a pretty little dandelion. You can't beat me. And she is worse than anything that Finn has read in his Irish mythology books. Her kiss will burn it to the ground and tells him to run and then transforms back into Bray laughing. Mm -hmm. This has officially surpassed the Randy Orton feud (laughs) as the worst feud of 2017. (laughs) This clinched it for me. Oh, boy. This was among the worst segments in raw history. Well, it was certainly uncomfortable. Um, So, okay, let's just go backwards. Let's just try to dissect this. (laughs) So, Sister Abigail um, is inside Bray Wyatt. And now Bray is... uh, She is speaking through Bray. So, it is Bray... Uh, essentially in drag. Um, she's burnt, and that's why Bray has like the black rings around his face, cause uh, burnt people, you know, they got ash all over their eyes. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I don't know if it can really be taken as anything but camp at this point. You might find it scary if you're under like. At the age of like seven and a half, maybe. Or Finn Balor. Or if you're Finn Balor, it makes him look so stupid. God, he went God. all in on this to like sell it, and it's like, oh, Finn. It just, and, and, but above all, it went on way too long. Like at the end of this whole thing, it was just another long Bray Wyatt promo with a lot of just verbiage that's just all uh, way too abstract to connect um and just really long-winded so uh i can't believe like i can't believe they they went this direction what i don't understand is that when they were producing like those countdown shows on the network or they'll go back and, and produce a dvd on you know the history of wcw and they find stuff like this and everyone tears it apart and yet when they have to come up with stuff, they come up with shit just as bad that they openly mock on their network. That it's just, I don't know. It's true. It's true. Definitely. Like, 15 this is years the shit from now. that they'll be making a fucking uh, DVD about Finn Balor in three years. And they're going to talk about how he was at such a low point in 2017 and questioning if this is going to, if the WWE is going to work out for him, if mm-hmm. he was really going to ever get over and he was in a dead end feud with Bray Wyatt talking to a dead sister that had incarnated his body. It, it's already happening. I mean, Cody, you know, we'll talk about all the shit he had to do as Stardust. Um, it, it still happens, but you don't hear about it as much because they're in control of that narrative. Um, it, you know, I, I actually had hopes high hopes for this feud because I thought you could have done some cool things with the demon plus the Bray Wyatt world, but it's really, uh, underwhelmed and it's re- it's reached kind of uncomfortable, cringeworthy, um, levels. Unfortunately, this was like a real opportunity. I think everybody was excited that maybe they were finally going to introduce a new female, uh, accompaniment to Bray, uh, you know, as sister Abigail, that's not happening. Instead, who's playing Sister Abigail? How about Bray Wyatt? So this match is going to be something. Yeah, I mean, okay, so do you want to talk about the Balor follow-up segment right now? Uh, sh- uh, where he's interviewed? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Renee interviewed him several segments later, and... He says, in all seriousness, he assumed Bray had lost his mind last week when he said Abigail was dying to meet him. He says Bray may have unleashed something awful. That was correct. And felt the words echo through his head. And he felt pure evil. And now he knows what he has to do. So my question is, does Finn Balor have a sister inside him? Uh, oh God. 
Well, he has to unleash the little girl within himself, perhaps. I don't. We went from man versus man. Now it's going to be woman versus woman. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this means. What do you think Finn has to do? Any guesses? Uh, go back to New Japan. <laughs> That's what he has to do. Immediately. Yeah. Uh, another baby face that is going to be uh, dead at the end of this feud. And I figure, I almost feel like after these wins that Finn has had, that Bray's going to win this next match as Abigail. Oh, he has to. He can't lose three in a row, can he? What, what do you think Jim Cornette would feel about this storyline? Oh, my God. Well, because, I mean, it's interesting because, like, he'll he'll complain about, like, all the flippy shit. But then, like, wasn't he, like, didn't he slap Santino over the uh, him not selling the boogeyman thing? Yes, but, I mean, he wasn't trying to push the boogeyman as being campy. He was trying to make him as yeah. a feared villain. Neither Neither is Bray Wyatt. I don't think they're trying to put, portray this as a campy thing either. They're trying to make this actually scary. Well, the execution and how it's received are sometimes very different things. Well, I'd love to know his thoughts. Well, this was terrible, and the feud continues, and I assume they're having a match at TLC. Yeah, I, I think that's a safe, safe assumption. But this was oh, death. Man. This was seriously one of the worst Raw segments you're ever going to watch. I mean, it's not even like the matches themselves are all that great. So even just to continue this feud, to drag this on for three matches, that's already asking for a lot. And if you don't have the storyline to live up to it, much less something that is like just bad and laughable, I think maybe that's the only way you can enjoy it at this point. You know, it's just to see how bad it can get. Maybe maybe it will be Sister Abigail. That's going to challenge Brock Lesnar. Uh, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Maybe Sister Abigail wins this match and can get a shot at Brock Lesnar. Oh, sure. I, I'd love to see Brock Lesnar involved in this shit. I just want to see Bray come out in a dress. Uh, I think that would just... If you're going to go this direction, you have to go all the way. You, you don't know? see Sister Abigail as more of a power suit kind of woman? No, I don't. Maybe she'll have like burnt clothes and. Or, no wait, so so wait, but she's sister Abigail, like she's like a sister, like a like a nun, correct? Is that the it, type of sister? I thought I thought it was his literal sister. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe um, Bray dressed up as a nun. Yeah, isn't that what the the thing was that he was wearing? Like a like a sister act. Like he was wearing a, it was it was a veil. How about singing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Jesus Christ. Uh. Sasha, Emma, Bailey, Dana, and Alicia had a horrendous five-way match. Booker says the winner of this match could be like Buster Douglas with the chance to upset Oscar. Setting your sights high on your main roster women. Emma and Dana work together. Then they start going at it. Dana hit a pair of handspring back elbows. Then Bailey went up for a scoop slam and was just dropped by Dana. These two were terrible together. They had more awkwardness, and Bailey just finally hit her with the Bailey to belly and pinned her. And everyone, including Michael Cole, thought this meant Bailey won the match. No. It turns out this was an elimination match, which, after the break, Michael Cole basically blamed the Bray Wyatt segment for throwing everybody off. But, uh, yeah, this was this just seemed like the announcers weren't up to speed on what the actual rules of this match were. I don't know if anybody was. Like, no. Ang- they, Angle, Angle didn't mention it. No, he was, uh, he didn't mention any of this elimination stuff. So this match continued, and not for the betterment of our enjoyment. So Fox hit this. Bad scissors kick to Bailey and just pins her out of nowhere. The crowd starts to boo. You could not have come up with a more unceremonious way to eliminate Bailey. Just and mean nothing. This whole thing I think could have been avoided if you just made it single like a single one pinfall and had Emma no. sneak in there with a with a but instead you had to have everybody get pinned. We we had to have a match it. designed so that we could pin Bailey in all of this. Fox and Emma then double team Banks. Fox tried a sunset flip out of the corner onto Emma for a two count. Then 
Sasha applied the bank statement to Alicia. She finally submits with this weak tap, so Sasha cannot see the tap, and Emma capitalizes by cradling Sasha from behind and pins her. So Emma wins and will face Asuka at TLC. This yeah. I thought this was awful. Yeah, it was a bit sloppy. Just ah, I, I, sorry, we're too negative. We're way too negative. What did you what did you like about this match? If you had to pick one thing, what did you like? Um, it did end, um, and that, that was about it. Can't say anything um, positive about Dana in this match. Uh, I like every. I think everybody's hair looked pretty good. Um, what else? Um, I'm trying to think of all of their hair. The entrances was were good. Um. Maybe um maybe uh what the this is a good ba- uh Bailey to belly, I think. Oh yeah, because it ended Dana Brooks' involvement in the match. Mm-hmm. Go watch that scoop slam attempt again. Drop Bailey right on the shoulder too. <laughs> yeah, I uh, um again <laughs> I just think about how Asuka will fit into all this, you know. Because I feel like there's a very high level of women's wrestling that's out there, and this match did not show it at all. Good conclusion. Charlie then interviewed Kalisto, which, way I know you must have perked up and paid attention to this. Kalisto, live on TV. Oh, I was on the edge of my seat here. I, I, I was sink or swim, you know, live TV. I was about to, to witness it. He mentions Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero as his inspirations to work hard and travel the world and make his dream a reality. He couldn't watch Enzo be champion because he's a slap in the face to everyone that came before him and a slap in the face to him. And he's going to make Rey, Eddie, and the WWE Universe proud as he becomes Cruiserweight champion. And did a fine promo. He did totally fine. Totally fine. I hope that he, be, he read that script for eight hours today. Uh, eating it. <laughs> he did the totally promo of the year last year. Yeah. Uh, they mentioned next week there will be a steel cage match between Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman in Portland to go into TLC, and TJP taking on Rich Swan on 205 Live. Make your reservations. Enzo comes out for his match, and this was unbelievable to watch. Enzo does his usual promo coming down the ramp, and Corey Graves just gets into a Zamboni and steamrolls Enzo. He just yells over Enzo's promo, so you can't even hear Enzo saying, we've heard all of this, we've heard all of this, and just destroyed Enzo here. Enzo, I'm, yeah, yeah, go so, ahead. No, I'm, I'm positive. This, this had to have been under Vince's instruction. You know, no commentator is just going to talk over somebody else's uh, introduction in ring even yeah. if it was enzo right no so, i can't imagine Corey doing this on his own because he just buried enzo yeah. and the way this all played out was very strange but then enzo addresses the lumberjacks that are already out there saying you couldn't cut this tree down if you were paul bunyan and his big blue dog and Corey just yells it was an ox it was an ox you idiot and then, as Enzo spells out soft, Corey yells, more like B-O-R-E-D. And Corey was just destroying Enzo here. And you're right. Just, like, I'm it, sure this was instructed, but to what but it, point? Oh, exactly. Like, like Corey comes across like a heel. He is kind of the heel announcer, is he not? And isn't... Shouldn't he be supporting Enzo? Um, yeah, it just it seemed kind of like just more evidence of like people wanting to mm, I don't know get the last word over Enzo and embarrass him on TV rather than you know to have any type of real effect. So the match begins, lumberjack match for the title. Enzo got the heat. He kicks at the ribs of Kalisto. Kalisto got thrown uh, to the apron. Came back with a springboard cross body. Enzo then threw Kalisto into the bottom turnbuckle using the back of his head. And then Kalisto goes to the floor, got stomped by the heels. Enzo hit this very loose flatliner for a two count. 
Then Davari and Ali start fighting on the floor as all the Lumberjacks brawled. Kalisto nailed Enzo on the top, and Kalisto superplexed Enzo off the top onto all of the cruiserweights on the floor, which did get a big reaction for the visual. Enzo then countered a Salida del Sol in the ring, hitting the Jordenzo. But then Mustafa Ali pulls Enzo to the floor, breaking the cover, and Mustafa starts yelling that Enzo doesn't represent him, so Enzo calls him an ugly son of a bitch and clotheslines Ali. Enzo and Kalisto then fight to the top turnbuckle. Kalisto back elbows him several times and hits a top rope Salida del Sol and pins Enzo. Clean. Wins the title. All of the cruiserweights celebrate Kalisto bringing the title back to them as Michael Cole announces that the era of Enzo is over. This felt like something that should have happened four months from now at a pay-per-view. Hmm. And instead it happened three weeks, two weeks after he won the title. <laughs> Like, this felt like the end of Enzo, and the way they just buried him beforehand, like, this was a very strange end to the show. It didn't feel like the end to me. It felt like now we're going to see Enzo. I mean, the focus of the show will continue to be Enzo, and I think we're going to see the Enzo chase, and, you know, still to still the seeing chase, Enzo as just, the focus. Like, the whole thing was that he took this title, yeah. he was able to get them not to touch him, so mm-hmm. he could keep this title hostage until someone would be able to like this was a several month storyline of different cruiserweights trying to bring the title back okay you didn't even you didn't even do it wait but let's say he beats Kalisto. where do you go from there who enzo yeah i don't know why this happened tonight i thought at least you would do this at the pay-per-view i just don't think it even has enough i mean yeah you could probably done it at the pay-per-view but beyond that I just don't think the division has enough legs to have another challenger for Enzo after, you know, everything that's happened in the past several weeks. Where was Neville, by the way? He wasn't there. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe he's being protected from all this. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just assume we'll get the rematch uh, probably at the pay-per-view and then, uh, yeah, maybe even a series. But uh, I also feel like they probably aren't... Mm, treating this Enzo title run with that much prestige, you know? I feel like for a Cruiserweight title, they probably don't feel all that bad about uh, hot potatoing it too much because to them it's probably, it's a, it's really a C-show title, right? Um, but, I, you know, I don't hate them giving Kalisto the belt right off the bat because it establishes Kalisto as, you know, some a legitimate uh challenger unlike so many of the other people that have uh, competed in the division he's somebody that people know uh yes his promo i think is probably quite weak but um yeah we'll see we'll see how he does i also don't ex- necessarily expect it to be that long of a reign i do ultimately see enzo continuing to be the uh main character of this division yeah i just felt that you know this this all happened he had this two week reign and to me it's like there was there was this whole chase in the cruiserweight division trying to get the title off of this guy that this guy could just sneak away with the title through all these various means. And I mean, they did this big celebration at the end that Kalisto had brought the title back. And it's like, this could have been a lot longer than two weeks. And I I don't know. It just felt, it, it just feels like they're just doing this week by week. And tonight the whole no contact thing made no sense. So they just threw it out the window and and they just had this idea, and we made this title match on two hours' notice. No, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I, I think they just want to come up with ideas that'll make you want to watch every single week. That'll make the, like I think they just want to give you a result that you can talk about every single week to at least keep your attention. And I don't know if that's conducive to them prolonging this feud for months. You know. What did you think of Raw? Was this uh, this was a tougher show. one to get through, and I, maybe some of it admittedly had to do with like my energy levels because I typically nap before the show. Uh, I didn't. Oh no, I don't know. But that's no excuse, honestly, because like I don't know any TV show that, <laughs> that you have to prepare me. for. Oh, like I'm not even John. You know what it's like. Anybody who sit tries to sit through the show knows what it's like. Like this is the only show on TV that I actually have to. 
work, work yourself up for prepare like, i have to work at watching because if i don't work at it i will miss everything like i will just like and i'll fall asleep i'll just kind of miss a, a lot of details i have to actively put effort into like doing this and uh i i can't say that about any other show that's on tv so i don't know what that says i don't know yeah i mean I thought the shield stuff was really good on the show, but uh, everything else, I mean, there was way more bad than than good on this show. Uh, there, there was some really mm-hmm. bad stuff. Uh, the Bray Wyatt stuff immediately comes to mind. I, I wasn't a big fan of the the cruiserweight stuff at the end. Um, it just felt very. It just feels it's it's a division that whatever they come up with the week of, they go with, and it just doesn't feel like there's much long term planning behind it. I. I mean, I don't think you're wrong. I think they're just trying to come up with wacky ideas every week, but it just doesn't feel like there's any continuity from one week to the next of where they're going. So it's hard to really get behind any of the characters. They're just so mm. flippant with their decision-making. So Ra has one more episode before TLC, and uh, still, I figure, like, this card... How many matches do we have now? We have the TLC match... We mm-hmm. have Alexa and Mickey James. We've got probably Enzo Kalisto, you could assume. Probably Finn and Bray. That's probably yep. a guarantee. Um, do we know much else beyond that? Uh, Jordan maybe might have a match with Matt, maybe. Um, yeah, tag match. Sasha and oh, Bailey right. aren't, aren't accounted for. Ba- uh, we do have Emma and Asuka. Oh, yes, right, right, right. So maybe Sasha and Bailey aren't even on the show. Um, who else is missing? Titus and uh, Elias. This doesn't feel like a very deep card. No, it doesn't at all. It's uh, it's the one big match, Oscar's debut, and I mean Alexa and Mickey will be fine. But uh, the question is, you know, does every show have to be stacked top top to bottom, especially with the way their the you know their 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 networks built now? Like, look at Hell in a Cell. You know, really, it was a one match, perhaps two match show on paper, or maybe we'll just kind of be seeing a lot more of that going forward. One really hot main event, everything else is just, it's like boxing, you know? It's an under, undercard you could miss. Well, that might be TLC. So, get ready, Minneapolis. WWE is coming to town. All right, that will bring Review of Raw to a close, a lengthy edition of the show, so, so thank you for listening. Uh, we are going to be back on Wednesday. We will have Review of SmackDown coming out for you. We will be chatting about the fallout from Hell in a Cell, and... Uh, Sami Zayn and the explanation on Tuesday night. So that is coming up Wednesday. uh, We will no Thursday. I'm sorry. We will have Jason Agnew and bartender Dave with what's next new MMA report coming out this week, which is going to be a different show this week because it's kind of a quiet week. So this week is the 20th anniversary of pride's first ever show. So this week we are going to go back and we're going to rewatch the first pride event from October of 1997. Cool. With Hicks, Hicks and Gracie and Nobuhiko Takata, and one of the worst fights you're ever going to see with Dan Severn and Kimo. So that's all coming up. Oh, I'm jealous. That sounds fun. So that's up Thursday. Friday, we'll have a new Keep It 2000, and of course, The Law, every Sunday night at midnight Eastern Time. And Way, um, can people go on uh, YouTube this week for the Pro Wrestling Tees Contest? Are we doing that this week? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. So if you are watching this on YouTube right now, leave us your favorite and least favorite moment of Raw in the comments below. Make sure you're subscribed because Sam will check and you could enter a draw to win a free t-shirt, including that sweet cease and desist t-shirt from the Young Bucks or any of our live audio wrestling t-shirts at Pro Wrestling Tees. All right, that is going to do it all for us. So thank you for listening, and we'll speak with you on Wednesday. You guys call yourselves lumberjacks? Well, you couldn't chop down this tree if you were Paul Bunyan and his big blue dog, buddy. He had an ox, dummy. It wasn't a dog, it was an ox.